Good afternoon and welcome to another Research in Action brought to you by the Division of Research at Florida Atlantic University. My name is Karen Scapinado. I will be today's moderator and host. And it is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Chet Forbes. Dr. Forbes is an associate professor of psychology in the Charles E. Schmidt College of Science and associate director of the FAU Styles Nicholson Brain Institute. Um, he's a first generation college student and earned his bachelor's in psychology with a minor in uh, biology and chemistry from Long Beach State University, and then uh, received his master's and doctor doctorate degree in psychology with an emphasis in social and cognitive neuroscience from the University of Arizona. And I'm just going to turn it over to him to let him tell you about stereotypes and why they are bad for your health. Chad? Great. Thanks so much for having me. This is uh, super exciting and, and I'm honored. Uh, to talk about a little bit about my research with everybody. So I'm going to share my screen here. All right. So I assume everybody's seeing that. Um, so yeah, today we're going to talk about uh, why stereotypes are uh, and bias are bad for your health. Um, just a little bit about me, as, as uh, Dr. Scarpinato uh, mentioned, I, I am a social neuroscientist by training. So I use social uh, methodologies with, and in conjunction with cognitive neuroscience methodologies to help us understand more about who we are uh, as people. So along those lines, my research interests broadly defined revolve around that hollowed question of how we come to know thyself. Uh, and I look at a lot of the ingredients uh, with respect to how we come to know thyself. So I look at things like memory encoding and how we reconstruct memories in ways that help us uh, inform our, our, ourselves. Um, I look at the role of emotion and stress in uh, altering different types of brain networks, for instance, that influence how uh, these processes. I look at how uh, I look at all these things in relation to the expectations that we have both for ourselves and uh, that we have applied to us, given just the, the simple um, uh, color of our skin or the category of a social group to which we are ascribed with. Um, so uh, one overarching theme you'll kind of see from, from various things we talk about today is how these factors, um, all of these things, kind of interact to either promote or hinder resiliency in stressful life moments. So to study these things in my lab, we use lots of different measures uh, that range from micro to macro, uh, but they ultimately revolve around this goal of assessing inherently complex phenomenon. So we imply things like, we'll talk about a lot about brain stuff today, but we've also done genetic stuff. We try to get into the more applied realm as well, uh, looking at groups and, and like different school settings and things like that. And then I'll talk even a little bit today at the end about um, some uh, real global or more kind of uh, uh, countrywide patterns that we look at through these big data endeavors. But uh, so today we're going to implement that multi-method approach to examine one particular, uh, a couple particular vexing complex social issues. And that is this question of why, or that this uh, premise that stigma and bias are ultimately physiologically stressful to people and, and uh, bad for their health. So we're going to talk about this initially with respect to stereotype groups, career pursuits and their well-being in uh, different types of fields. Uh, we'll look at, we'll talk a little bit about group performance, how these things manifest in groups. And then we'll close with uh, a discussion on the, the role of chronic stress resulting from this bias. Uh, in terms of uh, predicting mortality rates and things like that for different people in our country. So uh, to start, one example of the link between stereotypes and stress has to do with the career aspirations for women and underrepresented minorities with respect to fields where they are negatively stereotyped. So despite making great strides in civil rights and gender equality, stigmatized minorities and women still face an uphill battle as they progress into the upper echelon of academia and science, technology, engineering, and math related domains are what I'm going to refer to um, from this point on as STEM. So the best evidence for this is this leaky pipe, pipeline effect for women and, and uh, ethnic minorities in STEM domains. This analogy is used to describe the fact that starting around the time of high school and continuing all the way through college and even into grad school in the highest levels of, of achievement, um, girls and women and underrepresented groups leave STEM domains at dramatically disproportionate levels compared to boys and men. Uh, but these overt patterns are underscored by more subtle, pernicious, kind of paradoxical findings in the literature. So, for instance, 
based off of this one meta-analysis by uh, ElseQuest and colleagues, uh, they, they looked at 493,000 boys and girls across the world, and they were interested in their scientific achievement in particular. And what they found was essentially there was a negligible, negligible difference between boys and girls in math and science achievement. There's a moderate to, to negative effect size. Uh, but when there was, uh, when there, when, when there was a, an achievement difference between boys and girls in a given country, it was usually because these countries were more misogynistic in general, which was defined, defined in a, with a number of parameters. But where boys and girls did systematically differ was with respect to how they felt about math. So girls in general tend to report more negative math attitudes and emotions compared to boys. So while boys and girls may have performed equal or comparably to one another on tests of math achievement, girls walked away from these situations feeling more negative, having more negative attitudes and feelings about math in general. And we found some similar things in my lab as well, where even when people are performing the same, if not better, in this case, this was with underrepresented groups, um, they, some tended to think they actually did worse on, the, on these tests than, than, um, than they even did. They actually would do pretty good. So undoubtedly, these types of feelings probably play, uh, impo are important ingredients for keeping people, uh, keeping people motivated per to pursue careers in these different domains, uh, especially when you experience the up and ups and downs of any given uh, academic pursuit. So the, today's talk, uh, the first part of today's talk is going to focus on these mechanisms that uh, may, may lead to some of these different patterns. And we're gonna start by talking about how the, the burden of societal expectations, in other words, stereotypes, play a key role in altering not only how people who are the targets of these stereotypes feel about themselves in the moment, but may bias a lot of things in the brain that ultimately leads to these more negative kind of chronic uh, feelings in the domain over time. So this may help explain one reason why uh, uh, stigmatized individuals might opt out of these STEM domains at disproportionate levels, um, regardless of how they're actually doing. So the main answer to why stereotypes are stressful is because at their core, negative stereotypes are threats to the self. In other words, how we like to define ourselves as individuals. So this is the, certainly the case in STEM, where uh, regardless of what of the stereotype that people endorse, in other words, what they think is true, most Americans have knowledge of a negative stereotype that women and underrepresented groups are believed to be worse at math and science compared to men. Again, that's just a knowledge. It's not necessarily your personal belief. Um, and uh, that, that changes as a function of different types of fields, of course, too. So you might not necessarily have those types of stereotypes in um, areas like neuroscience, but you definitely have them in places like physics and uh, computer engineering and things like that. So assuming most people have knowledge about this stereotype, including women in underrepresented groups, this sets the stage for what's referred to as social identity threat. So social identity threat refers to the situational burden that targets of negative stereotypes experience when they fear that others will perceive them or they will perform in a manner that is consistent with the negative group stereotype. Ironically, this fear leads in these individuals to behave in ways that confirm and ultimately perpetuate the stereotype itself. Um, but this can be reversed as we'll talk a lot about later on, but you can think of this in a way as just like it might be stressful for you to feel embarrassed uh, to make, make mistakes in front of people uh, either you care about or not, um, or uh, not perform up to your, uh, to your expectations or others' expectations for you, a uh, stereotype ident a stere uh, social identity threat argues that negative stereotypes about your group may be stressful too because they represent societal expectations for your group that ultimately and ideally you do not want to confirm. So importantly, a large body of literature indicates this is fairly simple to engender. Someone who is the target of a negative stereotype simply needs to be placed in a situation where their stigmatized group membership is made aware to them. This could be as simple as indicating their race or gender on a uh, on like a the SAT or the GRE exam, um, and uh, or being a numerical minority in any given situation. And then they're going to, they're told that they're either going to interact with people in this other more positively stereotyped group, uh, in group members, uh, or complete some kind of assessment in the stigmatized domain. This latter uh, uh, phenomenon is referred to as stereotype threat, and that's going to be a lot of what we talk about today, technically. So this suggests, nevertheless, that people who are the targets of negative stereotypes in a given field might regularly find themselves in situations that are self-threatening at their core. 
So importantly, uh, these social identity, these stereotype threatening contexts have been shown to be physiological stress, physiologically stressful at their core. So for instance, stereotype threat research, which has been going on for about 25, 30 years now, uh, has shown that uh, situations of stereotype threat, when people are put in those situations I described a second ago, they elicit increases in blood pressure, skin conductance, skin conductance alpha amylase, cortisol, uh, and neural markers of stress. In other words, they're experiencing physiological uh, metrics that we, we almost always see when people are feeling stress. And this is coupled with this, arou uh, coupled with this arousal. Uh, stereotype threat also makes people feel pretty crummy in the situation emotionally. So uh, when people are under stereotype threat, they report heightened levels of explicit anxiety, um, self-doubt, negative expectations, feelings of dejection, and task-related worries. So when individuals find themselves in a stereotype threatening context, their body and brains respond the same way somebody's body and brain might respond to an actual physical threat. And so I'll refer to this, uh, at this kind of phenomenon as stereotype-based stress. So based off of that, this might suggest that, uh, and based off of that and other past literature, this suggests that threatening information that's received in these types of contexts, these threatening contexts, might be processed differently uh, than information that's not threatening. And that's because it turns out there's a lot of evidence in the cognitive neuroscience literature to suggest that when people are in negative mood states and they're experiencing stress-induced physiological arousal, they're more likely to remember information that's consistent with their mood state. So this phenomenon is referred to as mood congruent memory encoding or something like uh, emotional memory encoding. Uh, and the idea is, again, we're more like it works both ways when we're feeling when we're kind of feeling like negative emotions, we're going to remember more negative aspects about a situation when we're feeling more positive emotions, we're going to remember more positive information in comparison to neutral and uh, or, or incongruent information. So uh, with respect to our stuff, given that these stereotype threatening contexts tend to be imbued with these kind of emotions and arousal, we've got all the ingredients we need. It suggests that stereotype threat contexts provide a perfect forum to promote these kind of mood congruent memory encoding effects, such that uh, information that is consistent with that stereotype confirmation, so doing poorly on a test in this case, may actually be perceived to be more arousing and thus remembered better compared to positive or neutral information, because this information is consistent with that emotional state that people are experiencing in that moment. So uh, an essential component of this hypothesis then is that this is going to be the product, these types of biased memories are going to be the product of uh, the brain kind of processing information in these threatening contexts differently than when it's uh, in these more neutral, stress-free contexts. So uh, to, to examine how these processes might unfold over time, we turn to the brain. So we could look at these things online or while people are engaged in these different types of processes that we're interested in. So past, with respect to this, past research has suggested uh, or made it pretty clear that a region in the medial temporal lobe here called the amygdala, it's a little shaped like an almond, that's where it gets its name from, uh, is a critical region for the experience of emotion. And it plays a, a key role in the experience of negative emotions like fear. So when the amygdala comes online uh, in a stressful situation, it actually orchestrates this processing of information that's consistent with that, those negative emotions uh, in concert with other brain regions, including the hippocampus and, and, and a number of other regions, including in the prefrontal cortex, that all work together, basically, to help facilitate encoding of this negative stuff better. And again, this, this, these are networks, these are brain, uh, these are processes that make a lot of sense when you're experiencing some kind of like real scary situation, right? Like you, you happen upon that lion out on the Serengeti or something like that. But then these same networks come online in these, in these other types of situations where maybe it's obviously not so great if that's what's happening. So we, uh, we looked at then in one of our studies at this basic idea that when people are seeing this information uh, that's consistent with the stereotype, in this case, you're solving a math problem, you see that you get the problem wrong, that's serving as like this little micro moment of confirming that stereotype, that stuff's gonna be more stressful and thus that's gonna be remembered better than information that's not consistent with that uh, that mood state or that stereotype, in this case, positive feedback, saying that you got the problem correct. 
So we, uh, in this, uh, this particular study, we put men or women under stereotype threat or not. We would tell them uh, in the stereotype threat condition, you're taking this diagnostic math test, it's gonna tell us how smart you are in math. Uh, and then we have them mark their gender. Um, and that, uh, whereas in this problem solving task, we say you're going to complete this problem solving task and you're not, we're not gonna, you're not gonna mark your gender or anything like that. So in other words, in one situation, you're priming the stereotype and you're priming the person's group membership in that, in that stereotype group that's expected to not do so great. And then another condition, you're not doing that. And past research suggests pretty reliably that uh, the, the latter, the former situation is going to cause people, women in this case, to underperform. Whereas uh, in the control condition, women usually perform comparable to um, everyone else. So uh, we had people complete this specific type of math task. It would consist of something like this. There would be, uh, they would have uh, the problem with three options. If they answered the problem correctly, they would see feedback that looks like this. And if they answered the problem, uh, or they might see feedback that looks like this. And if they answered the problem incorrectly, they might see feedback that looks like this, or they might, be see, they might see something that looks like this. And so why did we do this? Um, well, we just wanted to mess with people. Uh, no, not really. We didn't want to mess with people. We were doing this for a reason, uh, obviously. Um, and that is uh, what we were trying to do was basically take neutral information which in this case are just these, all these different kind of silly types of fonts. And we want to tie that type of neutral information to this feedback that might actually be either stressful or not. In this case, the negative feedback saying you got that math problem wrong or the positive feedback saying that you got that problem right. So we wanna see, in other words, if, uh, if we can kind of yoke this, this, this neutral stuff to this more negative or positive stuff, then we can go in and see uh, what people are remembering with respect to these types of font feedback pairings. So along those lines, we had a uh, participant complete that feedback task, then they complete a traditional uh, difficult math test consisting of GRE problems. And then we give them a, a surprise memory test. And we say things like, did you see this? Or did you see that? Or we give them stuff they hadn't seen before. And through that, we can calculate these behavioral measures of memory accuracy. In other words, their people's ability to kind of discriminate that which they saw from that which they didn't see. So after they did that math test, then we had them do the self-report stuff. We asked them to you know, tell us how they were feeling, but we also importantly for hypotheses and how, and people's well-being, we wanted to see how much people cared about math afterwards and felt like they had abilities that might've been equal to, if not better than their peers. Both of these are really important factors with respect to people remaining engaged in these kind of uh, these kind of career aspirations. In other words, it's important to say, I really care about this stuff, and I think I'm pretty good compared to others. So this is so the methods that we use is just for your reference. I'm not going to test you on any of this stuff, but the basic idea to, to capture here is we're taking we're looking at uh, while people are doing these math tests we are recording their brain activity. And uh, when we do that, uh, we can then go back in and we can say, what is the brain doing when it sees this positive or negative feedback? And importantly for our hypotheses, we can look at things like the amygdala activity and these regions that are important for remembering that negative, that emotional stuff in particular, and we can look at how they are talking to each other, okay? And so we did, we did that during the math test and then we did that during their, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the memory test as well, looking at how these brain regions are all talking to each other, with the idea being the more they talk to each other, the better they might be at these different things, whatever it is you're, you're interested in looking at in the situation. So just to kind of preface what usually happens in our studies, and these, this study was no different, um, we tend to find these, these standard stereotype threat effects. So in this case, we're looking at how women performed when they're under stereotype threat or not. So we have our stereotype threat and control, we have our men and women here in the, the dark gray and light gray bars, and this is how well they were doing on that math test. And what we found was the traditional stereotype threat effects, where women perform more poorly in, in the stereotype threat condition, uh, but women in the control condition perform comparably to, uh, to men. And uh, men always in the stereotype threat condition tend to perform a little better. We could talk about that at the end if you want. That's a standard finding as well. Also importantly though, women remembered that negative stuff better compared to the positive stuff. So when we were looking at those behavioral measures of memory, those D prime scores, 
Here we have women and our uh, men in our different condition. The DMT is the stereotype threat. The PST is the control. Um, the white bars here are there is those how well they're remembering that negative those negative font feedback pairs, and these stripe bars are how well they're remembering those positive feedback pairs. And we see here again stereotype threat uh, when women were in these stereotype threatening contexts, they were remembering that negative stuff a lot better than the positive stuff and better than everybody else. Also importantly, though, uh, when we looked at when we ran these statistical models uh, to look at the relationship between this, uh, like the amygdala activity, when people are seeing this negative feedback in relation to what their brains are doing, how they're talking, how these regions important for memory are talking to each other when they're doing that memory test. And then things like the objective measure of memory, this D prime score, we found that only women in the stereotype threat condition encoded negative compared to positive feedback via this emotional memory network. So in other words, when they were seeing that negative feedback uh, during the, the, um, the math test, they're exhibiting more amygdala activity. That then predicted these kind of downstream, how these brain regions involved in memory are talking to each other. And that activity predicted how well people were remembering those, uh, those negative font feedback pairings. More amygdala, more brain connectivity in its memory networks, better memory for that negative stuff. That wasn't happening with the positive stuff and it wasn't happening in women in the control or men in either condition. Equally important, when we kind of extrapolated on this, we, we, we uh, looked out further, zoomed out, we found that this bias memory process <clears throat> also predicted these kind of downstream uh, measures of well-being and how much people cared about math. So decreases in math valuing as a function of this increased brain uh, processing of negative information, negative, uh, remembering these, this negative information, and also decreased math self-enhancement, meaning uh, women in this condition were saying that they didn't think they had the same skills as their, um, uh, their uh, boys or, other, or even other girls in these situations. Um, one important thing to kind of keep in mind too, we were also skewing that math feedback task a little bit um, to try and make sure that people weren't seeing tons of negative feedback or positive feedback in either condition. In other words, the women in our in, in this and the women and men in this math feedback task in particular were actually kind of performing comparable to each other. So we have some initial evidence for that stuff that we talked about at the very beginning with Els Quest and colleagues for this pattern of performing fairly similar, but leaving these situations feeling different um, as a function of uh, whether you're a woman in this stereotype threat condition or not. So after finding evidence for these basic hypotheses, we've since moved on to examine how these processes may play out over time. So uh, one idea that we had was that continual exposure to these identity threatening contexts may lay the foundation for more chronic stress responses in stigmatized domains and possibly even aversive like responses. So, uh, and, and this, is, this, is, uh, this could be expected because uh, importantly, when people, when, uh, when women or, or uh, underrepresented minority groups go into these kind of stigmatized domains, right, they go, they try to pursue careers in these stigmatized domains, uh, they are often in these situations uh, that we talked about at the beginning that are primed for these, these kind of experiences of identity threat. In other words, you can imagine like a woman going into a physics class. Uh, we actually did this at, at a school, uh, at a local high school when I was back at the University of Delaware. We went into this class and we saw we there was there was two girls and there was 18 boys. Um, so that's those are pretty uh, those are pretty brutal situations, uh, brutal context uh, for for people if they're trying to avoid these kind of identity threatening contexts. So that's kind of the some of the logic behind why we think that this uh, these these academic or career pursuits might lead to this more chronic stress exposure over time. So to test this basic idea we ran another study that first looked at how the brain of women and men responded to biologically aversive stimuli like snakes, all right? So we show people pictures of snakes and then we, we come in here and we look and we say, which one of these brain regions were talking really well to other regions, okay? So in this case, we find some that were really talking to each other more when people were seeing these um, biologically aversive stimuli. And then we, uh, we ran another task where we took those same brain regions or sorry, we, so we created this aversion, like this aversion network as we, we kind of coined it over time. 
Uh, and then we could look at, uh, uh, we can use that information to generate this new network that we could then assess when women were exposed to potentially aversive information that they might see in sit context or identity threatening context. In other words, things like pictures of men in lab coats, which might be threatening in the right context um, for women or, or underrepresented groups. So what they're seeing, uh, so we're, we've had these new brain regions now that we're coining this, this, um, this aversion network. And we can basically uh, see how this brain, work, brain network interacts with itself when people see these potentially aversive uh, pictures uh, like men in lab coats or negative feedback uh, going back to similar to, to what we did um, before. So taking this approach, uh, in another study, we placed women in an identity threatening context and we presented them with negative feedback at day one, similar to what we did in the previous the study I just described. We looked at how active that new network, what, uh, again, what we're referring to as this aversion network, we were looking at how active that was in response to negative feedback that women and men were seeing, okay? So they're taking a similar math test to what we were just talking about, they're getting that positive and negative feedback. And now we're looking how much is that, that aversion network talking to itself when these people are seeing this, this positive and negative feedback. So then we had women and men come back a week later and we had them report on how often they found themselves thinking about their last visit to the lab and how negative those thoughts were. In other words, we were looking at how much they were kind of ruminating on that initial experience, that identity threatening experience that they'd had a week prior. Uh, and so sure enough, when we did this, we found a pattern only, again, in women in these identity threatening contexts, indicating that uh, increased connectivity between regions in this aversion network predicted rumination one week later. So in other words, the more these regions talk to each other in response to negative feedback at time one, the more women reported ruminating about that lab experience one week later. Importantly, we've also found uh, similar patterns among actual STEM majors. So this was a longitudinal study that uh, my, my grad students and I conducted back when we were up at uh, the University of Delaware. We were taking STEM majors and trying to focus on those STEM majors that were uh, in these more stigmatized fields like physics and engineering and things like that. Uh, and so we had these, these, these students come in initially and we first had men and women STEM majors complete this difficult math test, similar to the same one we've been using all along at time one. And then we looked at how much uh, the regions in that aversion network, the same network we were just talking about, were talking to each other when women and men were being presented with this positive and negative feedback. Okay, so everything's still the same. Uh, it's just now we've got STEM majors and they are, uh, and we're looking at how this aversion network is talking to itself uh, when people are seeing positive and negative feedback again. So then uh, two semesters later, we asked participants to come back into the lab and write an essay for five minutes that asked them to basically recount everything they remembered about their first visit. So you could think of this as just like, you know, give it, tell us all about what you remember, but the real, what we're really interested in is them essentially uh, exhibiting this memory recall that we think might be biased as a function of how this aversion network is talking to itself in this initial period or two semesters earlier. So after they wrote for five minutes, then we were able to analyze those essays and determine how often people recalled more positive or negative math oriented lab experiences. So it's just some, some code that we can run. It's, um, it's more non-biased in terms of we just, we run the, we run the essays through this these algorithms and out it spits these kind of metrics for how often people were saying math oriented things and negative emotional things or positive emotional things or neutral things. And uh, sure enough, again, what we found was that increase in uh, aversion network strength to that negative feedback and that very first day they came into the lab actually predicted women STEM majors, but not the men's uh, negative math oriented recall uh, two semesters later. So here again, to just demonstrate that, here's this aversive network connectivity, higher numbers mean more connectivity. This is to that negative performance feedback. Here we have the, uh, whether they're reporting these more positive or whether they're reporting more negative memory, math memories in comparison to no math memories. And our blue bar is the women and our red bar is the men. And so what we see is this pretty pronounced pattern 
uh, where women are reporting these higher levels of negative math memories uh, in relation to whether this aversion network is talking more to itself when people see um, are seeing that negative feedback. So this suggests that those negative memory biases are evident during testing situations uh, that, that are evident during testing situations can form these more negative enduring memories over time. So we've also then looked at, uh, uh, based off of this basic premise then that someone might be stressed out when they're in these identity threatening situations. We've also looked at uh, whether then this, uh, this emotional or stress response can actually be transmitted to people who are in your in-group. In other words, people who are similar to you in some way, which could be ethnicity. It could also be uh, gender, how you, how you identify, all those types of things. Those are people in your in-group. And so there's a, actually a lot of interesting past research that suggests that uh, we can kind of make people not only just feel, you know, like, like I have this feeling that, you know, I'm feeling more that you're making me excited or more upset or something, um, but you could actually make the same brain regions kind of resonate. So the brain reasons that are, the brain regions that are active in you when you're feeling these positive or negative uh, emotions can actually lead to another person kind of syncing up with those same brain patterns and then feeling the same response. This is a phenomenon uh, we refer to as uh, emotion contagion. Same kind of the base, a really good example of that it could also just be like, like if you go to a sporting event for something or something like that, and something really exciting happens, and maybe you're not that exciting, you're not that excited initially, but when you're around a bunch of rabid screaming fans, you tend to get aroused pretty quickly, usually pretty positively aroused, assuming something could happen for your team. So we were taking that same kind of uh, idea and looking at whether that happens, uh, there's any evidence for that, um, when two people, in this case, two women, are solving math, uh, math equations to get together, and one of them is under stress, they're in this social identity threatening situation, and the other one is not stressed. So what we would do is we would bring participants into our lab and we would hook them up on uh, to the EEG, and they would then be connected in real time in, and in real life uh, with another participant. Um, in this case, we were just doing women, but we've since done men and women and stuff too. But um, for now, we were looking at uh, how these two people were basically not just interacting with each other when they're solving these math problems, but how their brains are operating in response to one another uh, during the course of this, uh, this math task. And so what we could do then is kind of similar to what we did in the other studies, we can look at how people's brains are responding when they're seeing that negative or positive feedback. And then furthermore, how activity in this brain at time one, right, on problem one, what effect that has on their part, their partner's brains at time two and problem. And what we're specifically, what we were specifically looking for is whether stress-related activity in this brain essentially predicts uh, stress-related activity in the partner's brain, the otherwise non-stressed partner's brain. And so what we found was, sure enough, uh, consistent with kind of emotional contagion phenomenon, uh, when one partner, in this case, this stereotype threatened actor, was stressed out when their brains were responding in this kind of standard stress way, uh, that predicted increases in their partner's uh, emotion network connectivity as well. So they, the, part, the actors are stressed, they transfer that stress essentially to their partner, not only, uh, whereas this, uh, and notably, this doesn't happen when people aren't, uh, when people are both in that kind of control condition. Um, but importantly, this has consequences for the partner's performance specifically. So as a fun, so as the uh, the stressed person transmit their stress response to their partner, that their partner's performance decreases over time. Interestingly, what we weren't totally expecting, but which kind of made sense with. Um, past research, the DMT, the, the stereotype threatened actor, that stress actor was actually benefiting a lot from the partner. So it's kind of, we're, we're still studying whether that's taken the form of kind of like, here, you take this burden, you take this stress, and now I feel better, or whether there's something else going on. It might be something more like self-affirming as well, too. We're still trying to figure that out. So what we've been doing is ex we've been uh, since extrapolating on these kind of basic findings and we've been tracking, uh, we've been looking at how groups interact with each other, not only when one person might be stressed out and transmitting that stress response to particularly people that are like them, 
but also uh, what are ways that we could potentially null, uh, uh, nullify those um, those effects? In other words, uh, not just nullify, but restructure classrooms and group settings such that all students thrive. Um, and that's something we're hoping to actually continue here, um, hopefully in partnership with um, places like A.D. Henderson. So uh, importantly, we, we, I, I, don't, uh, I always try not to be too doom and gloom with respect to a lot of this stuff. And going back to those initial kind of overarching ideas that I'm interested in, and the, those ideas specific to resiliency, um, it's not always the case that when people are in these identity threatening contexts that they underperform and experience stress and, and all that stuff. Um, and in fact, maybe you're thinking in the audience, that you know plenty of people who are really, or you know, plenty of women are underrepresented groups that are really good at math or they're really good at science and they thrive in these types of situations. And, uh, and so consistent with that, we've actually found some evidence, um, some, some more brain-based evidence that uh, helps us identify who is going to be kind of more or less susceptible or who is more or less resilient in these identity threatening contexts. And so in one example, I know this is a complicated graph, don't don't pay too much attention to it. Um, we'll pay attention to it, but you know what I mean? Like you don't have to encode it all. But the basic idea of what we're trying to, to do here is one thing that's really cool that we can do with um, our brain-based analyses is uh, we can actually now look, instead of like when people are seeing positive or negative feedback, we can look at their brains while they're solving math problems. And so we have people solve lots of math problems. And so we get lots of kind of snapshots of what the brain is doing uh, when people are solving math problems. Um, but obvious, uh, but uh, for um, in case you're not a, a neuroscientist, which, which I assume many of you are not, um, it's also important to know that different parts of your brain do different things. Um, so parts of your brain are really important for the things we call executive function, or when we have to think really hard about something, or we're trying to focus on something while uh, kind of keeping distractors at bay. There's also parts of your brain that are involved with emotion. There's also parts of your brain that are involved with regulating that, that emotion. There's parts of your brain involved for attention. And there's also a part of your brain that's really, uh, there's parts of your brain that are really important for kind of who you are as a person, your identity, uh, and, and your, your kind of well-being, personality, all of those types of things. And so uh, what we had found in this particular example then uh, was this uh, using this uh, advanced uh, method of analyzing the EEG data, uh, the brain-based data, uh, as a function of how all these different networks that I that I mentioned were kind of talking to each other while people were solving these math tasks. Basically, what we found was women would do really good in these stereotype threatening contexts. They would do really well on math performance um, when they had this, what we call this default network that might be really important for coping and kind of self-processing, you know, who you have, knowing who you are as a self, as a person. Um, you, people were doing better when that brain read, that network was more active and kind of supplementing these other networks that are really important, like those executive function networks that you need to like really focus on things. So we found, we've kind of found a reliable pattern with that over time where people who, whose default modes talk better to each other, they tend to be more resilient in these um, stressful contexts. And just as a quick example, we've also flipped the, the effect in the past um, just by either blunting or exacerbating that, that aversive or arousal-like response. So in this one study, we, we used this method that's been used to say, you know, for instance, like um, kind of train um, uh, like snake phobics to be less uh, phobic of snakes. We were able to use kind of a similar approach and, and which ultimately served the goal of kind of blunting that stress response uh, or making it worse amongst men and women uh, in a stereotype threatening condition uh, or, or context. And what we found was basically when we, we got men to like exacerbate that arousal response, they did a lot better than women. However, when we blunted that arousal response, women did a lot better than men. So we were able to kind of flip those effects, those standard uh, threat effects as a function of how we were, um, of whether we were blunting that, that uh, stress response or not. All right, so finally, uh, I just want to close on some of our other studies that show this, uh, this direct, um, this link between not just career aspirations and well-being, but uh, to even far more serious outcomes uh, like mortality rates. So, 
uh, a lot of research has shown to this point, um, a, a ton really, that uh, bias and discrimination, whether it's intentional or not, right? Whether you have intentional negative attitudes towards others or not, affects stigmatized individuals' mental and physical health. We see pretty, we see countless examples of this, um, but one really clear disturbing pattern outcome of this is, is in looking at just straight up mortality rates of black and white Americans in this country. And which typically show that uh, black individuals are, uh, die much earlier compared to uh, white Americans. This is really pronounced in early uh, and before age one, but it continues all the way throughout the life cycle uh, until around 80 when, when the groups kind of uh, level out in comparison to each other. And so one, one, uh, one explanation, that this is a complex phenomenon, obviously just like everything else, uh, but one potential explanation for this, uh, or one uh, one influencing variable, uh, could be chronic stress that can, that stems from continual exposure to bias. So uh, you could think of it this as like you know living your life, and and if you if you're out in the world, you know you're at your job or something, and you're in a situation where you think like maybe your boss or your coworkers are are judging you or or don't like you based on just a simple a, a social group that you belong to. Those th that perception, that feeling can be really stressful for people. And then if you keep that going, you, you, you just repeat that, that pattern over and over throughout time, you're invariably exposing to one group to disproportionate rates of stress compared to another. So indeed, perceived discrimination has been linked to things like depression, anxiety, psychological distress, psychosocial and physiological stress, as well as negative health outcomes. And so uh, that's in conjunction with other things like uh, the, pers that the, the fact that um, uh, underrepresented groups often reporting either regularly or occasionally experiencing racial discrimination. So feeling like they're being discriminated based off of a social group to which they belong. Um, so what we were interested in this study then was looking at uh, what the role of bias-induced chronic stress might be on objective outcome measures, in this case, stress-sensitive health outcomes that are, uh, that may are, are in other words, health uh, mortality rates uh, for diseases um, that are uh, typically made worse by chronic stress. So, and uh, this was a big data study that we conducted. We looked at um, 2.45 million uh, individuals who had completed these implicit and explicit measures of racial bias. Uh, and this was across the United States, okay? So uh, we, so this was uh, every county basically that met these certain metrics that we had, every county uh, in the US, we would average the ratings for non-Hispanic black and white subjects um, as a function of every US county. We also calculated uh, regional demographic stressors of uh, uh, regional racial heterogeneity or how diverse a given uh, county is, as well as how segregated it is. So um, with kind of like the, some of the worst contexts in, in terms of um, these mortality rates being, for instance, like a really diverse area that's also really segregated. In other words, the groups don't really interact with each other, but a lot of groups are in contact with one another. Uh, importantly, we were able to control for all kinds of different things. So uh, to, to kind of isolate what the effects of bias specifically might be for these, um, these diseases that are sensitive to stress. So among these, we had, for instance, like county level assault rates, population density, white and black population percentages, net migration, white and black poverty rates, white and black high school completion rates, political preferences, religiosity, median age, and gender ratio. So in other words, we were able to control for a lot of confounding relationships, including racial disparities in socioeconomic status or demographic characteristics of the counties, like political lean, population density, so on, um, that's also associated with physical health outcomes. So we took a lot of that stuff kind of out of the equation. That stuff has been shown before. And what we were doing was we were then using these measures of bias, segregation, and, hetero and, and diversity to predict the prevalence rate of Medicare patients uh, who were both diagnosed with stress sensitive diseases, in this case, Alzheimer's, asthma, cancer, diabetes, heart failure, and stroke, 
um, but also eventually died from these, um, these diseases. So these are actual mortality rates that we're predicting. And basically what we found was, uh, just to, to summarize it, we found a lot of different things, but uh, we found a very common pattern, which is basically uh, that both bias, uh, both implicit and explicit bias was linked to actually the death uh, to mortality rates and the prevalence rates for every disease we looked at for both white and black patients. In other words, the bias, um, the, the reported bias within a given region was detrimental to both groups. But this pattern, this relationship was typically much stronger among black patients. So uh, in regions where uh, black patients were uh, more likely to have experienced these high levels of implicit, of implicit bias, they were uh, more likely to develop cancer in this case and, and, and have a stroke compared to white participants. But importantly, these, these relationships are both positive and statistically significant. So it's bad for everybody, but it's worse for, in this case, these black patients. So in summary, I hope you've gotten a, a, a good idea uh, of, of how, uh, of the, the real deleterious consequences that bias has for everybody's well-being and, and even our health. In fact, I would argue that bias is a, a different type of health pan pandemic. Um, it, it plays a key role in altering career aspirations of, of individuals, mental, mental and physical health, and has massive consequences for the state and country. This, I mean, just the tip of the iceberg, we spend billions of dollars of extra dollars on healthcare dealing with these, these racial disparities. And of course, with respect to career aspirations, we lose out on talent in areas of great need, uh, including healthcare. And, and we saw all these, imperf all these things on, on display in the past couple of years with COVID. So uh, what we've talked about then today is that the roots of these issues can be found all the way down to the building blocks of our brains and bodies, where things like these stressors that, that we experience as a result of these groups to which we belong can change how our, memory, our, our memories for different situations in the moment and over time, change who we, how we feel about ourselves as individuals. Um, but it can also alter health outcomes for everyone, but particularly stigmatized individuals who are the targets of this bias. Um, but I don't want you to think that there, there aren't ways to address this because there are. Um, obviously, it's, it's, it's complicated um, and it would require a large scale effort that uh, attacks kind of two multiple fronts. So I say top down and then bottom up because uh, really what would need to happen is obviously um, the institutions need to change, healthcare needs to change, uh, our classroom structures need to change. That has to happen, that's the top down, right? That's changing the system. But we also have to instill people, uh, individuals who are stigmatized with skills to help deal with the situations that they're in now. That would be kind of the bottom up. So helping the people understand why they feel the way they do, uh, which past research suggests when you teach people about stereotype threat and identity threat, <clears throat> they, it, it actually helps a lot. Uh, so you're welcome out there if you didn't know about it. Uh, but you can also teach them skills that may help them deal with stressors in the moment. Uh, so for instance, past, some past research has shown a link between mindfulness uh, um, manipulations and increasing that default mode network connectivity, suggesting maybe people might be able to uh, cope with stressors in the moment a little bit better. But, and obviously it's imperative to address uh, serious discrepancies in healthcare for different groups and the role that bias has in fueling these, these uh, differences. To that, uh, I will say thank you so much. And I would like to thank my uh, past uh, funding uh, uh, organizations, NSF in particular, and also member, uh, members of my lab who've now gone on to do great things, including uh, Dr. Amy, Dr. Megerman, Dr. Liu, and Dr. Splan, um, and my social neuroscience lab. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Chad. We have time for a few questions. Just as a reminder, if you have questions for Dr. Forbes, please uh, post them under the Q&A button in the bottom of your screen. Uh, if we don't get to all of the questions, we will ask Dr. Forbes to answer the remaining questions offline and we will post the answers on our website, DOR Research in Action. All right, Chad, 
Um, coming back to the stress uh, that individuals are feeling and how to alleviate that, you just made, uh, mentioned the mindfulness. We have a question here on whether you have explored mechanisms to alleviate the post-treatment, the post-traumatic response. And uh, giving an example here that research has found that soldiers who have witnessed a potentially traumatic experience and then played a an electronic game such as Tetris uh, showed uh, decreased symptoms of PTSD. Is that something that has been explored in this uh, scenario as well? Um, to my knowledge, no, but that's a great, that's an awesome question and a, and a great connection because a, a lot of this research was actually inspired by some of those, some of that past research. So it's not even just like having soldiers do um, different, uh, different games and things like that, but they they've done some crazy things that have even, um, where they, it's a little contentious. It's, you know, it's science. So that we're still fleshing things out, but they've been actual, they've been trying to blunt the PTSD response. In other words, um, uh, through these kind of memory manipulations. So actually getting people to kind of change how they reconstruct those, those traumatic memories. Um, and, and with the idea being they're targeting specifically this, that link between the stress and the memory and, and the, the, uh, the negative emotions that result from that. Um, but yeah, so we, we have not, uh, to my knowledge, there haven't been like mindfulness oriented studies in the realm of, of identity threatening context. Um, but that's something we'll, we'll probably do soon. I'm, I'm still getting my lab up and running, but we've had that kind of on the back burner for a long time for the reasons you described. Yeah. Yeah. We should mention that Dr. Forbes is relatively new to FAU. <laughs> Um, uh, actually related to the previous question, we have another uh, question here. If you actually have any data on uh, the female male differences in the military of stereotypes, I should say. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, that's a really good question too. So yes, uh, there, there has been documentation of that. Um, I, I actually worked with some people or I, I was some of my colleagues at, uh, when I was at the university of Delaware, they were working with, um, uh, military bases in, in New Jersey at the time. And yeah, they were, they were doing this research, looking at how potentially, um, uh, you know, when, like in the military, it's, it's pretty common to have, you know, teams and groups interact. And there's, there's a ton to be gleaned from those interactions. Um, but among them were, were this, this finding that, you know, if in the right situation, these, you can create these kind of stressors, these, these kind of identity-based stressors within uh, when women, particularly when they're being, when they're outnumbered by men. Um, but there's other things you can do to, to alter that. And that's kind of uh, some of the, some of the research we, other research we've done that I haven't talked about that has stemmed from that has looked at how um, there's, you know, there's lots of differences in leaders and, or people who are assigned to leaders within these groups. And that can really dramatically change how uh, women are treated in the, in the group and how their, you know, their opinions and, and input is valued. And so there's a lot of variability on there too that, we, uh, that we've looked at. Very interesting. The whole environment, I, I'm sure, has some effect on that. Um, coming back to the first study that you talked about, um, you showed a disproportionate representation in STEM that is due to stereotypes. The question here is, uh, is it really a stereotype or could it be based on the sex-based preferences? And the individual here is saying that gender equality paradox studies of 475,000 teens in 67 countries found that countries such as Albania and Algeria have a greater percentage of women amongst their STEM graduates than countries uh, lauded for their high levels of gender equality, such as Finland, Norway, and Sweden. Can you speak to that? Yeah, yeah, I know, I know the study that that they're referencing. I, I think I do. Um, it is a really interesting find. That that's a that was a paper that came about came out about six, seven, eight years ago, something like that. And they had these really paradoxical findings showing that, um, among other things, it was it was about the opportunities, right? So if you're in a society where uh, you have a lot, like all the options are available to you, um, they they found that women would kind of go do the jobs that gave them the most money, kind of like you would expect, right? Whereas in those other countries like Algeria, uh, the women are actually really, uh, they are encouraged strongly to go into those STEM careers specifically. So again, it's kind of like the, the power of the situation or the culture. And there are, there are dramatic cultural variations as a function of a lot of this. There's also studies in the, in the Netherlands that fail to ever document these, these kind of stereotype threat effects. So um, 
yeah, but I think the in return in terms of like um, there's a whole other field of of these kind of gender disparities that argue for these more biological differences, and I, I think the uh, I, I acknowledge that work is is there, but I would also uh, I would also stress that given all of this other literature that shows just how sensitive all of these things are, you know, you can you, you can have women perform better than everybody. You can put them in a context where they perform worse. It's it's really malleable. So that to me would suggest it's not a biological thing. It's it's a it's a power of the context. Thank you. Um, I'm going to finish us off with one last question. Again, if you have additional questions, please type them in the, um, the uh, question and answer box. And we ask Dr. Forbes to enter those offline and post the answers. Uh, or you can contact him directly after the presentation. Uh, OK, Chad, um, you showed earlier that male performed uh, somewhat better under the stereotype threat. And here's a very specific question related to that. Um, do you know of studies that um, are on the negative impact of positive stereotype? For instance, Asian males, especially East Asian males from China, Japan, Korea, uh, are often expected to do well in STEM areas and, and then also end up in uh, related fields as their careers, which creates that kind of stereotype. And are there any studies on the males uh, that are put into under that uh, stereotype threat? Yeah, there are. So um, uh, thank you for that question. Um, yeah, so the, the, the phenomenon is actually, it's the opposite. It's referred to as stereotype lift. Um, it's a smaller effect than stereotype threat effects, but it's a reliable one that if you kind of look at these larger, if you kind of collapse across a number of studies, something they call meta-analyses, you find this reliable effect that the positively stereotyped group actually performs um, a little bit better. Uh, and, and the idea, there, there isn't like a fully fleshed mechanism for why that happens, but we think it has something to do with that, that arousal component, right? So you, you're still experiencing that arousal because you're in that kind of evaluative situation, but now you're expected to do well, right? So you don't have that, like those, those extra concerns that, oh, I'm gonna look bad or I'm gonna make myself myself or other women or under other, other underrepresented groups look bad in this situation. So it actually facilitates performance. And I, I wish I had more time, but we, we're still fleshing a lot of it out, but we had so many, we have really cool effects when we're looking at that, um, taking all that kind of aversion stuff we have the we have a lot of evidence for the total other side of the coin where men are kind of doing all of these opposite things that are predicting a lot better performance in those situations, but only when they're in those uh, those you know positive stereotype prime conditions essentially. So saying you know you're you're going to take this math test and we expect you to do great essentially. Yeah, very interesting. So I encourage anybody who wants to hear more, please contact Dr. Forbes um, you know offline uh, and uh, chat with him. With that, thank you very much, Chad. Thank you, everybody, who for calling in. And we look forward to seeing you next week again at Research in Action. Have a great rest of your day.